Welcome back. Last time we talked about integration and how important that is, how important a concept that is for the spiritual life and for everyday life in our psychology. And so I want to get into that and why it's so important. Talk about disassociation versus the watcher mentality that is talked about in spirituality, how those are two very different things. So let's get into it. So first we have to look at our neurology. Let's say we're looking at the neurology of who we are and what we are as a totality. And any time that we take and group ourselves into a part, the neurology will build a border around that part. And so in that part, you will think one way and outside of that part, you will think a different way. And so in NLP, we call this a part. And so we've all had this experience where part of us wanted to go this way and do this thing. And a part of us wanted to go this way and do this thing. And so we're at odds inside of ourselves. And so for the, the neurology to be able to hold both of those thoughts simultaneously, it builds up a little wall around one or the other of that neurological thought pattern. And when you're doing parts integration in NLP, you can actually see that wall around the, the part that's in the neurology. The person will come to the edge of it and then they'll pull back and then they'll come to the edge of it and they'll pull back. And that's why the part stays in the neurology. It, it never gets exploded. And so what happens is eventually the person will go through the part and it will explode. It will come together and integrate with the whole of the neurology. Everything that's in your mind will, sign, will start to sync together. And so you won't think about one thing one way and another thing another way. It will start to come together. It's really beautiful, really beautiful therapy. I will be demonstrating parts integration at some time because the Tad James parts integration was phenomenal is phenomenal. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful therapy and everybody should have a chance to see that at some point. So there's a condition that's called disassociation and the person will turn away from something in their life. Something in their life will not be comfortable. Something in their life, they won't want to look at it. And so they'll turn away from it. And as they turn away, where are they going? Well, they're not going back as the watcher in a spiritual fashion, they're actually retreating into a part and they're wrapping themselves around in the neurology with a barrier. And so they will feel very disassociated from everything in their lives. Most often we can't do timeline therapy because they're disassociated from their emotional content. They are not integrated with their bodies and so they tend to be discoordinated. And, and so they, they just kind of retreat from life and they stop functioning. And it's because they're going into this part, which is walled off in the neurology. Fascinating, right? So how does that differ from being the watcher in a spiritual practice? Well, being the watcher is actually a wonderful way for somebody who is disassociated to begin to find their way out of that. And so what happens when you're the watcher is that you watch, you sit back and you watch everything in your life. And that means that you're beginning to integrate with the whole of yourself, which includes your body, which includes your emotions, which includes your thoughts. You sit back and you watch all of that. And by allowing yourself to witness the whole, you start to integrate with it. And that's the core difference between disassociating into a part and being one with the whole, you see. So when you have a spiritual practice and you become the witness and you witness your own life as if you are standing behind yourself, watching yourself, 
or standing behind yourself and watching your thoughts, you, you take in the totality of your life all at once, which is very akin to Hakala, isn't it? We look at one point, but we take in everything. Are you starting to see these parallels? And so disassociation is very different in that you're walling yourself off away from all the things in your life which feel icky, right? And so I don't want to look at that and I don't want to look at that. And instead of processing it out and getting through it, we pull away from it and wall ourselves off from it. And that is the difference. I had a wonderful student call me up and ask me, you know, some people say that I should just throw my anger out. And some people say that I should embrace my anger. Well, which is it? Well, it's, it's the embrace and then throw it out. So it's a pattern. And so if you, if you throw something out before you're ready, before you feel, okay, I'm, I'm ready to let that go. Well, you don't really throw it out. In, instead, you're walling yourself away from it. So first you have to embrace what you're feeling and, and say, you know what? I'm angry. I'm pissed off. I'm upset about this. Ugh. Okay, now I can get over it. Now I can throw it out. Now I can let it go. But if you don't do that first, if you don't come at home with yourself, if you instead push away from yourself, well, now you're beginning to go towards disassociation, aren't you? And the difference is, if you embrace it, you're heading towards integration and then letting it go. Getting over yourself, getting over the problem, getting over it, right? Two, two very different things. And it's so essential that we understand this in our spiritual lives because otherwise we'll get very confused and we'll just push ourselves away from things and maybe we'll become an ivory tower that never makes a mistake, right? And yet we're not that spiritual because we are disassociated from what's really going on inside of us. And so it, it, when somebody turns from disassociation to the whole, to integration, then they will feel a little bit uncomfortable because they're turning towards the things that they didn't quite want to look at. And so you, you, they might even feel nauseous in their stomach. But I've seen it happen. I've seen them do it. And when they're very brave and very enthusiastic, they will turn towards themselves and it'll be a little uncomfortable. And then, oh my God, I... I I'm actually coordinated again. I'm actually at home with myself. I'm actually feeling okay, like I haven't felt okay for a very long time. And so they begin to integrate and then they start saying things like, I am one, I am centered inside of myself. That's where all that language comes from. That's an integration language. I am centered inside of myself. So you see, these are, these are two diametric opposites. Disassociation, integration into the whole. You see it? It's, it's really beautiful. And so as you integrate more and more deeply, we start to understand what the kahuna we're talking about in the three cells. Do you remember my video about huna and the three cells? It was quite a while ago. So maybe, maybe some of you haven't seen it. But the kahuna had this statue and it had the tiny little self on top, that's the higher self. And in the middle, you had the conscious self. And then down below, you have the subconscious self. And the Huna had this beautiful map that was told to me by Tad James. The Kahuna said, you have to go from the conscious mind down into the subconscious mind. And then from the subconscious mind, you had to go up into the higher self. So some, we, we talked about brain waves and a lot of people asked, what about gamma? Well, the gamma is the higher self, but the first part, the first leg of the journey has to be this subconscious route. So we have to come down into a very slow state, a very quiet state, a very low idle state in meditation in order that we can begin to reflect those gamma waves well. So that is the genius of this ancient kahuna pathway that they were telling us. And that integration, the very beginning of it, 
when all of those brain waves go online at once in the awakened mind, that is what begins to allow the reflection of the higher self, the gamma brain waves. They will reflect down into the lower self and the conscious mind will look into the lower self and it will see the higher self as a mirror image. So you have all these wonderful metaphors about the still water reflecting the moon. And that's what they were actually talking about. They were actually describing this process that by stilling the subconscious and integrating with it, by putting the body into a low idle state, we begin to reflect the higher self, which are these gamma waves of inspiration. And that's the journey. And so you can see, you can so clearly see with this model that we have to begin to integrate and own what we are and be at home with ourselves and not push away, but rather embrace and then let go. There has to be an embracing of ourselves and then we can do the work of cleaning. And that's what Om Chapa is all about, cleaning the chakras so that we can better reflect the higher self and go into a more and more low idle state. So I hope this blows your mind because when I heard Tad James mention this path, it blew my mind and it, it lines up with everything. And we're going to go into it more next time with a warning about stone samadhi. So I hope you love this. If you did, be sure to hit that bell down below so I could see all of you.